continuing on. All right, so with the four forces of flight, there are four basic four, four forces of flight. All right, we talked about lift, we talked about weight or gravity, thrust and drag, and then we talked about the subcomponents, which are induced to parasite. Um, okay, airfoil terminology. I asked you what is an airfoil. All right, your answer to that always: an airfoil is a device that's used to produce lift. Okay. There's no other, no other answer for that. API, primary, and your instructor pilot said, "What's an airfoil? It's a device used to produce lift. Period. Any device that's used to produce lift. So, give me some examples of uh, airfoils, please, that you can uh, think of." Obviously, an airplane. Um, well, airplane. I would say specifically not so much the airplane, but the wings. Oh, okay. okay. All right, the wings. Um, the the wings. Yeah. So uh, the wings. Um, I guess you wouldn't consider the propeller. Would you consider a propeller? The, the propeller is 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 a device that's used to produce lift. It just does it in a certain way. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Um, your horizontal stabilizer, your vertical stabilizer, they just kind of direct air molecules in a certain way. So they're all producing lift. Um, they're just kind of, um, I guess, redirecting it. So an airfoil is a device used to produce <laughs> any devices used to produce lift. Now, um, can you tell me what are the parts of an airfoil? If I drew an airfoil on the board, that's our wing. What are the parts of an airfoil? Uh, ailerons, flaps. Okay, those are types of airfoils. Let's take one Okay, you said ailerons and, and you said flaps, but they're all going to hold this type of shape, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's parts to this airfoil. I'm pointing at one, I'm pointing at another one, I'm pointing at one here, I'm pointing at one here, and this line is one. All right, so we have five different parts of, of an airfoil. So I know that middle one is the cord line. That is correct. That is the cord line. Very good. All right. Tell me about the other ones. Tell me about the other ones, George. <laughs> uh, I uh, believe it's been lost in terminology. I think it's leading edge. Very good. Leading edge. I'll abbreviate that. If we have a leading edge, then we also have what? The uh, trailing edge. The trailing edge. Very good. And what about these two parts? Those are called the the, um, the camber, camber. Upper upper and lower camber. Upper and lower camber. Okay, very good. Now, what causes a stall? Now, I hope you're taking notes, cause. Uh, yes, sir. I am. Yeah, good, good, good. All right. Um, what causes a stall? Uh, a loss of lift in the aircraft. Okay, that is correct, but specifically. When you go to primary or aviation pre-flight indoctrination, there's certain terms they're looking for. Uh, so, okay, it stalls when a, when a wing or an airfoil loses lift. But what, why, why did, why did that said airfoil lose its lift? It did something, or the pilot did something in order to make that happen. Uh it has to do with uh, the angle of attack. Very good. Uh, and while we're yeah. there and you open up that can of worms, define angle of attack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the angle of attack is... Uh, it's been a while since I've said this definition. Hang on. Let me see if I remember it. Um, um, it has to do with the cord line. I know that. <laughs> I think it's the angle. It's the angle between the cord line and uh, the, the airfoil. So we have the cord line here and we have the relative wind here. Can you see that? Yep. All right, so the angle of attack is the angle formed by the, the, the angle formed by the cord line of the wing 
and the relative win. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, all right. So what causes a stall? What causes a stall now? But the angle of attack uh, exceeds. We're exceeding something. Very good. I like that. What are we exceeding? Exceeds the angle. The uh, critical angle of attack. The, yes. That's what we have, have exceeded. Sometimes they put AOA or the alpha symbol like that. Mm -hmm. All right. An aerodynamic. So we exceeded the critical angle of attack. And the critical angle of attack for the T6, which is the first aircraft that you will meet in your flight training, the critical angle of attack is 18 degrees. Or some might express it in 18 units of angle of attack. So you can say 18 degrees, or you can say 18 units of angle of attack. All right. Okay. Five major parts of an aircraft. What are the five major parts of an aircraft? Uh, the five major parts of an aircraft. Fuselage. That's one of them. Very good. Uh, the propeller. No. Well, you know what? I can't even. I can't even kill you on that one. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We could say that. But we say uh, power plant. Power plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Brandon. This as we go. That's me. cool. This is what you're paying me for. <laughs> it's like, hey, you can pay me, but don't write shit down. <laughs> <laughs> Secret. Uh, so, do you think they'll say power plant on there? Oh yeah, they'll say power plant. Power plant. Because we don't, uh, we don't just call them engines. Why not? Because there's a lot of different types. Um, no, not so much that. We don't, we call them power plants because they do just more than drive the airplane. Even your car, and your car is a power, and your the engine is a power plant. It doesn't just drive the car. It provides air conditioning. It uh, provides, it, it moves your water pump, the circulation of fluids um, through the, you know, the, the engine. Uh, mm -hmm. What else does the engine do? I said air conditioning, so your environmental systems. Electrical, okay. The alternator yep. is tied, and not so much, these things aren't tied to your engine per se, or like, not like the internal parts, but they are connected. Your alternator right. is connected through via an alternator belt. Same thing in your Cessna 172. The alternator, there's an alternator connected by, and when we do our pre-flight, we make sure that there's not too much play in the alternator belt, because if there is too much play, then the alternator is not going to charge the battery. <laughs> right. And so when you fire your aircraft up, you're just going to be going, going off of battery power, and eventually you will lose electrical energy, and that is a bad day. Um, you'd be having a bad day then. Um, not be fun. <laughs> okay, so we said fuselage, we said power plant. What else? Uh, landing gear. Okay, what what is the function of the landing gear? And we're going to go back to the function of the fuselage, or I'll give it to you. Yeah. yeah. The, the function of the fuselage is to carry the payload, i.e. passengers, cargo, um, the cockpit. Um, okay, so landing gear. What does the landing gear do? Lands the plane. It does what? Uh, it it pr provides... Avenue for did you say lands safely. the plane? I did. <laughs> the pilot lands the plane. <laughs> That's true. I, I, let me rephrase. I'm it it you, provides bro. the pilot an avenue to land the okay. plane. Okay. <laughs> let's safely. let's do this. Let's try this. Let's try the Kino Vision definition because okay. <laughs> they will help you very much. Um, the landing gear supports the weight of the aircraft on the ground. Okay. All right. And if that is the case, then what is another component, and what does it do? Uh, the wings. The wings. So what do you think the wings do? Uh, per, uh, okay, it doesn't produce lift, but... Uh, wings provides. produce lift. Wings definitely produce lift. Produces lift. Yeah, the wings produce lift. I was trying to get too complicated with it. It's all right. How else are we going to fly this plane? We don't have any wings. That's true. All right. 
So the wings support the air, the weight of the aircraft in the air. That's what yes. they do. Um, and then the last part is the, um, uh, the tail. It's, there's a word, uh, pinage. Empanage. That's a French Panage. word. Did it's you French. know that there? Do you even are you aware that there's an international um, civil aviation organization? Uh, yes. And they dictate a lot of. They dictated at a certain point a lot of what pilots do internationally, because if you're getting in planes, you're going to be flying in different countries and stuff like that. But right. the aviation language is English. It was voted on. And so pilots that are going to fly internationally, it's a requirement, number one. Uh, number two, we almost lost a vote to French. So you as a, a pilot in the United States, you're, you know, private pilot, you're at any rate. Wow. Yeah. I'm a nerd. I, <laughs> that, uh... That, that definitely would have made things more difficult. Yeah, man. Not really, <laughs> because you do what you have to do. Think about all the That's people true. from other countries. And, and English is one of the hardest languages to learn. It's, That's it's, true. It's That's true. You know, we could say, oh, man, that, that car is bad, you know, and it means good. Or, man, right. that chick is hot. And they're like, man, well, maybe we need to put her in some air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> We don't mean that now, do we? Very complex, <laughs> yeah, very complex. We don't mean that yeah. at all if we say a chick is hot or a woman is hot. You don't really think about it, especially nowadays, because people people have made terms mean things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, English is, is a very tough language to learn. And if you really, really, really wanted to be an aviator, guess what? You would learn it. Yeah. You know, it might be a little broken, but you would learn it. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So five major components of an aircraft. We have our power plant or power plants, plural. If we're a single or a multi-engine, we have our fuselage, <coughs> excuse me, which houses the cockpit, passengers, uh, stuff. Um, and our payload is what we call them. Those are the people paying for the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about landing gear, and what are two types of landing gear configurations while we're there? There are um, two types of landing gear configurations. What are they, sir? Let's see. Damn, he's always asking questions. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Okay. We have conventional and tricycle type landing gear. Okay. Your old, old vintage aircraft, for the most part, a lot of them were uh, tricycle type aircraft. I mean, I'm sorry, old vintage were conventional or commonly known as tail draggers. Mm. Why did they call them tail draggers? Because, uh, like, there's, there's a little the wheel in the back. Yeah, the, the, the like tail a, stays yeah. up mm -hmm. until you slow down enough and then it comes mm -hmm. down. So it looked it as if you were dragging your tail. Right. Uh, if you were taxiing or taking off. Um, okay. And the ones that we see that are more prevalent nowadays are tricycle type. Right. All right. Um, then the emp empanage, it, it holds or it's uh, comprised of the uh, vertical and uh, horizontal stabilizer. Right. Now let's talk about the axes because when we say when we say a plural, a singular is an axis. Uh, plural is we would say axes. All right. So there are three axes of rotation, and one is an axis. All right. So, what are the three axes of rotation? I want to know that. I want to know the movement about the axes. Of rotation and I wanted to know the control surfaces that are responsible for producing these uh, said um, movements okay. about the particular axis that you're uh, going to demonstrate. Okay, uh, so we have the axis of yaw, 
Well, or, or, either, I'm sorry, the, the vertical axis. Yeah, y'all is the movement. Y'all. All right. Very good. Um, so it's vertical. Yeah. Uh, we have the longitudinal axis, which is the axis of roll. Very good. We roll about the longitudinal axis. And what is the flight control surface responsible for that? Uh, when you say flight control surface, what do you mean? Because there's a flight control surface that produces that movement. The, like, like the joystick? Uh, no, it? the flight control surface would be the aileron. Oh, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Okay, gotcha, like gotcha. the rudder. Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. You have your vertical axis, we use the right. rudder, right. and it produces yaw. We have our longitudinal axis, we roll, or use our ailerons to produce the roll. Right. All right. So that's what I mean by flight control surfaces. Okay. We need to be very specific about that because they're going to question you about this stuff. You know, not just for the test, but you know, you're going to be grilled by your instructor pilot. Right. All right. And so there's one more left. Uh, yes, that's the lateral axis. The lateral axis. What is the movement about the lateral axis, and what is the flight control surface that makes that happen? Uh, that is pitch. Okay, we pitch. And the yes. flight control surface, sir? Uh, elevator. Elevator. Okay, very good. Now, um, I'm, 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 I'm just kind of cruising through my list here and making sure we're hitting everything. I don't I think I ever said rudder for y'all, but it's rudder. It's okay. I won't judge you. <laughs> okay, buddy, I won't judge you. All right. Um, what is the next thing I want to be talking about? All right. So, um, tell me about ground effect. What is ground effect? Ground effect is... Uh, it is it the? I can't remember. It has to do some of the vortices off the wingtips. Mm, no. No. Okay, write this down. Ground effect is the Earth's interference. The Earth's interference with the airflow patterns about the wing. And we're concerned about ground effect um, when we get within one wingspan of the Earth. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. All right. Um, all right. So let's say we're flying it and we're at 2,000 feet. And we are getting our laminar airflow, and the uh, there's a natural upwash downwash effect that exists the laminar airflow. All right, and so this will be at 2,000 feet of altitude. Right. But then, when we get close to the Earth, within one wingspan. What happens is we don't have as much air down here below the airfoil. So what happens is we lose some drag. So we have the same amount of lift in both of these situations. Thrust, smaller drag vector, and our weight vector. So as a result, what happens, there's a couple things that can happen. Number one, when we're landing, we're coming in for a landing. Um, you ever notice, where do you live, if you don't mind me asking? What state? Uh, Texas. Oh, 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 they get lots of ground effect down there. Yeah. Especially around the water areas. When On a hot and humid day, you, you, you come in for your landing, you do your round out, and you do your flare. Right. And you, and you reduce your power. And the airplane just does not seem to want to settle down to the ground or to the runway. 
So it does something what they call as ballooning. And the uh, the explanation I hate is, oh, it's like a cushion of air. No, it's not a cushion of air. You have reduced drag, you have the same amount of lift. All right. The lift, is in, the lift vector is reduced. So that's what causes you hanging above the uh, ground. And I don't know if you've ever watched birds, but I know geese, they naturally, inherently know. They don't know about ground effect. They just naturally take advantage of it. You ever see like, that sweet spot? Yeah, you know when they kind of just, they're over the water and they're right, just kind of right. like, boom. And they might flap a little bit and then they kind of just glide over the water because the ground effect is is taking effect when they're within one wingspan above the water they have less air molecules in this upwash downwash process mm-hmm. and so as a result they can uh, glide a little bit longer All right um and taking off remember your short field field departures mm-hmm. okay so what what's the procedure we have the yoke or we have the stick like way way back Right. Because we want to reduce the abuse on the nose gear. Right. Uh, for soft field, in for soft field in particular, if you have a grass strip, you want to, you want that, you want that yoke all the way back. Uh, you you advance the full power. On a hot day, the because of ground effect and the inter the interference of the airflow patterns around the wing, what happens is the airplane can become airborne before. It's recommended takeoff speed. Right, right. I remember that. Okay, remember so that. as a result, but what we need to do is, if your climb speed is say seventy knots, K I A S means knots of indicated airspeed. So mm-hmm. let's say it pops up in the air at fifty-eight knots. All right, are you going to keep climbing, climbing, climbing out? No. No, you're not. You're going to level off above the runway until you right. reach your recommended takeoff speed. Because what happens when we get back to um, what happens when we get outside of the wing, one wingspan? Your hose starts dropping. The drag comes back. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, man, I was part of the program, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm in the party now. I'm inside. Right. And, then and I, now I, you're already in the yeah. air. And then you're at 50, 60, which is not your, and you can settle back down to the ground very abruptly and possibly uh, cause some structural damage. All right, so. It's really, really important that you men- mentally have your head around ground effect. Mm-hmm. You know, you're doing a soft field or, sh- or short field, the plane just goes, boop. Like, wow, we broke ground already. Pitch that nose over, level out, get to your climb speed, and then climb out. Because if you get to your climb speed and then you, you climb out, when the drag comes back, it's not an issue. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, since we're taking off, uh, we're talking about take take off and landings. Tell me about. I want to know about. It's like what you want to know, Kino. <laughs> I want to know about what are the function of flaps. Tell me what they do. Why do we use them? Uh, okay, I'll try my best to explain it. Um, use flaps to. I hope you either decrease lift or give you lift either on decrease takeoff lift? or landing. Decrease uh, lift? Maybe that's not the right word, no. but like except coming for landing, you put down your flaps. Okay. And it slows you down and it Yeah, so we get your angle. we get increased lift. We're increasing our angle of attack. Right. Right, right, right. Because now we have a new trailing edge, so to speak. Yeah. Um right. what else? What else? What else? Not uh, decrease lift. I'm sorry. Increase uh, speed. So you're increasing, you're increasing angle of attack. You're increasing the actual mm-hmm. camber because if I was coming in with flaps, but I'm also getting more drag. And then another thing, five knots. All right. So I'm exaggerating a sixty to forty-five. I mean, I guess seven knots, maybe. Um, but we're. The- Stall speed. <laughs> so normally, have our nose kind of pitched up with no flat, all right? Because mm-hmm. we're increasing our angle of attack to develop more lift at that slower airspeed, all right? So it's it's really really important that right. we understand lift versus speed. 
Um, sometimes when I'm flying and I'm the nose is actually pitched downward at crew. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm like the Verizon guy. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I want to maintain 2,000. At 60 knots, I'm going to have to have my nose pitched up a little bit. I don't know if you remember your, your slow flight maneuvers training. Uh, it's like too much lift. In order to maintain the stop increasing altitude, you got to actually pitch downward a little bit. All right. So we have to understand that. So the function of flaps. Um, we increase our camber. We increase lift. We increase drag. Uh, we delay our stall speed. Another thing is obstacle clearance. All right, we have our short field takeoff because we may have obstructions, buildings. Uh, even you go out to, out west, you have mountains. <laughs> you know, it's like wow, it's a mountain there. Okay, so, but you don't you don't use as much of a flap setting. You probably use about ten degrees because we want more lift curvature instead of drag and landing on a lot of drag going on so we get slow and delay our stall speed mm. all right um okay we talked about high lift devices uh we talked about uh all right. okay how are runways numbered uh they're they're numbered based off the the, the heading what heading? There's a lot of headings. There's true heading. There's magnetic heading. Um, uh, true heading. True. That answer. So, for example, that answer is untrue if you're saying true heading. <laughs> um, uh, I I give you an example. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay. All right. True north and the true south pole is where all the longitude lines go. They all start at one pole and they go to the other pole. Man, my artwork is getting good, man. <laughs> Got some practice? Yeah, lots of practice. Okay, so this is true north. The true North Pole is where our long, longitude lines go on our charts, sectionals and stuff. But, and don't quote me on this, but I'm thinking of somewhere from about 18 to 2,000 miles away is the magnetic North Pole. All right, the magnetic North Pole is where all the electromagnetic flux lines of the Earth go. All right. So, and it's it's roughly, don't quote me on the number, it's like almost a couple thousand miles apart. Yeah. So you could never ever use a magnetic compass to fly to uh, the true North Pole because if you if you if you point north with your magnetic compass it's going to take you here it's not going to take you there right now strangely uh the geographic north pole is a reference that we use because the magnetic north pole has it shifts a little bit over over time you know it shifts mm -hmm. i don't i forget the number of degrees and how many years and all that and everything but it's important that it moves so this is why on our charts, our chart sectionals and stuff, we have our, lat our latitude and our longitude lines, um, or our longitude lines going to the true north and south pole because that doesn't move. That's it's it's geographically fixed on the map. So topographically, it doesn't move, but the magnetic north pole moves. Now there is a way you can fly to true north. 
sort of, kind of, because you get magnetic dip and all that and everything. But theoretically, we have what we call magnetic variation. All right. So, have you ever heard that the memory eight east is least and west is best? Yeah. Okay. So, if my trip from point A to point B is going somewhere and I have a isogonic line running through it and it says five degrees east, then I'm going to adjust my heading east is least. I'll subtract five degrees. All right. And that will uh, take into account. I can fly with my magnetic compass in this area and it will make the adjustment for the var magnetic variation between the magnetic North Pole and the true North Pole. Okay. All right. Um, all right, ground effect. We talked about ground effect. What is Bernoulli's principle? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I believe, does that have to do with the... Uh, the high and low pressure above and below the wing. Yes, uh, it does. Yes, it does. But we use a device called a Venturi tube. And the Venturi tube is just, it's kind of like a straw, but it has a constriction in the middle. And if we took scissors or probes and we just put them in here, all right, we're going to be looking at two things. We're going to be looking at the velocity of the said fluid and air and water are very, they behave very similar velocity and we would be looking at pressure. And Daniel Bernoulli had nothing to do with aviation. Um, I think he worked with water systems and the book he published was called Hydrodynamica. But uh, we used Hydrodynamica are the works of Daniel Bernoulli to come up with Bernoulli's principle. And what that principle is, Bernoulli's, Daniel Bernoulli's principle is, as the velocity of a fluid increases, its internal pressure decreases. So, let's look at velocities. So, in this case, velocity is on top. So we have a, a gauge up here, and we have a gauge here, and we have a gauge here for velocity, right? So let's say this airflow, water flow, was moving at 100 miles per hour. Um, when we get here to this constriction, it's actually going to move at 130. And then when we get back here, it's going to go slow back down to 100. For pressure, for pressure, uh, we're going to have a positive pressure, then we're going to have a drop in pressure, and then it's going to go back to, this should go back to the original said pressure. Yeah. Or normalized. So it'll be normalized here and here, but at the constriction using a Venturi tube, when we plug our sensors into the Venturi tube, you're going to get a drop in pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So now that's negative pressure is what we consider it. So if we move all this stuff out of the way, you know, after all my fine artwork, I got to get rid of it. <laughs> all right. We could plug an airfoil in here. So we get negative pressure at the top and positive pressure at the bottom because of Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion, which is for every force, there's an equal opposite force. So some say for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. So right. this airfoil plugs in there, and this is why we get negative pressure on the top of the wing, all right, and positive pressure on the bottom. All right, so that's how lift is created. The air molecules actually move faster over the top of the wing than they do in the bottom of the wing because we call it a relative wing because it is relative. When you're in that situation where I talked about the bus and you're a kid and you stick your hand out the window, you feel wind blowing, don't you? When you're driving and you roll your window down, you feel wind blowing. Yeah. But the air molecules are actually still and you're moving through them. Okay, so that's why we call it a relative wind because wind is when I'm standing still. And like I'm looking outside of my office and, you know, I'm looking outside and I see the, the trees are stationary. The branches are stationary, but the wind's blowing through them. So those air molecules are actually moving. All right. 
But in this case, when we have our laminar airflow, and you know, we demonstrate our laminar airflow moving on top and bottom of the airfoil, then what happens is um, uh, we call it relative wind because the airfoil is actually moving through the air molecules. Gotcha. Okay, and I think I talked that point to death. <laughs> All right, so Bernoulli's Daniel Bernoulli's principle it is not going to go away now. It's not going to go away in API. It's not going to go away in primary. So these are some things that you want to just be able to just kind of just spit out verbatim and your instructor look at you like, oh, this kid knows his stuff. And that's what that's that's the type of relationship we like to have with our flight instructors. Right. Because you want them to make you comfortable. You want to make them comfortable so you can solo. That's what I'm saying. And do all this nice, comfortable, all this nice, wonderful stuff with these airplanes. Yep. Guy gets selected first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Half the battle. Okay. So. All right. You're pretty decent with the uh, aviation side of things. You're pretty decent. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's go into physics. Because the test does say mechanical comprehension, but over the past like six, seven years, they've been kind of moving to. And, and, and kinematics is the, like, just kind of quantifying, you know, like the motion of things and stuff. So. It does apply to mechanical comprehension in a way, but uh, I never thought they would like just go like straight physics when they went from paper to electronic. They yeah, kind of, I noticed that. Yeah, they kind of went. There were a lot of physics problems on there. I didn't know. Yeah. Well, you're going to get Kino vision, and you're going to learn it. You're going to notice stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's talk about um, and and actually, distance, rate, and time problems are actually. Uh, Physics problems, believe it or not. Hey, you know, before we get started, can I use the restroom real quick? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, you can use the restroom. All right, I'll go back to this. All right. I'm telling you, man, these guys want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. All righty. Okay. So now we're going to get into some possible physics questions that you could run into. The first thing, um, like I was saying, distance, rate, and time are actual physics questions. Um, and um, there are different types that we're going to go into. Maybe not this particular lesson, but... Um, maybe in the future, uh, but the formula that we always use is distance equals rate times time. If we're trying to measure rate, it is distance divided by time, and if we're trying to find time, it is distance divided by rate. But we can see the circular relationship because rate times time equals distance, and time times rate equals distance. Would you agree, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Now, um, but it's something that perplexes people. If I'm trying to find speed or velocity, it would be distance divided by time in both cases. What the hell is the difference? Kino, you're telling me speed times time equals distance, and velocity times time equals distance. How can that be? You're crazy. I'm not crazy. Uh, what's the difference between speed and velocity? Uh, velocity is... Uh 
I was literally just about to say. Sure you were. Everybody <laughs> says that. Everybody I was says say that. They see me right on the board. Man, I was just about to say that, man. We blew the surprise. Okay. Um, velocity has direction. It is a vector quantity. The speed is a scalar quantity. If I give you the speed of something, I'll just say, like, let's say, for instance, I invited you over for a cookout, right? And the dog breaks out the gate, and you say, hey, Kino, man, your dog, your dog left at five meters per second. Is that going to help me find my dog? No. Now, if you say, Kino, your dog ran at five meters per second towards Mrs. Jones's house. Then you've given me a direction. You've helped me find my dog. And I don't really own a dog. I just use that as an example. Yeah. So we have vector quantities and we have scalar quantities, which we're going to dive into a little bit later. But velocity has, has direction. Speed does not. Um, so I don't know if you get out of a ticket with a judge. Uh, but th listen, Your Honor, this is, he says I'm speeding. This is not my speed on this ticket. This is my velocity. <laughs> Don't get locked up. <laughs> You're like, Kino told me. Tickets. Kino told me. <laughs> Kino told me. Here's his number. Hey, yeah, right. <laughs> Mr. Thomas, oh, uh, yeah, you need to send some money <laughs> down to. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so velocity it has direction. Speed does not. But we use the same formula to uh, calculate them. So now, don't get all wigged out by the formulas because I work you enough. I work with you enough. I work enough for these. The first uh, formula that we're going to use is acceleration. Okay. We, we have an acceleration rate, and it's very, very important that you understand acceleration. Acceleration um, is, it's not a velocity. All right. um, we'll, I'm going to dig into it because a lot of people don't understand acceleration. Okay. When we accelerate in the positive, we speed up. When we decelerate in the negative, we slow down. So let's say, you said you're in Texas, right? Sure. All right, so you're getting on the highway. <clears throat> All right, you're coming off the county road and you're getting on the I-10, the I-20, or the I-40, right? And let's say that the highway speed is 60 miles per hour. And you're coming off the county road and you were going 35 miles per hour. And let's say it took you eight seconds to do it. No. Five seconds. You really got in there. You Yeah. Right, and you got up to highway speed. So V sub one is your final speed. V sub zero is your initial speed. And five seconds is time. So the time is in seconds. So when we measure acceleration, we say V sub one minus V sub zero divided by time in seconds. All right, so our, our final speed is gonna be 60. Let's put my A down here. My initial speed is gonna be 35. And the time in seconds is gonna be five. Now, I'll let you do the math, sir. Equals five. It equals five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sixty minus thirty-five is twenty-five. Over five is five. Okay. So what we have achieved in acceleration is five miles per hour per second. Mm -hmm. The hell does that mean? Five miles per hour per second. That is your it's acceleration okay. rate. So it took you five. So in this in the space of one, two, three, four, five. We had a pylon of speed. That's what I think of it as, is a pylon. 
And it's very, very important that you understand that it is a pylon. All right. So we were at zero before we started time, we we're at 35. After one second, we we're at 40. 45, 50, 55, 60. So five miles per hour per second. Every second, we piled on another five miles per hour. That's what that means. All right. But typically, on the test, you will be adding, you will be dealing with meters per second per second. Or what we say is meters per second squared. That's what that means. So miles per hour per second is just like saying um, meters per second per second. But we, we just break it down into meters per second squared. When we're dealing with the metric system, because this is the British or what we call the US customary system when we're dealing with miles per hour. And in the metric system, we're dealing with meters per second. And if I move too fast or if something doesn't gel for you, just stop me. I will explain. Yeah, yeah. But I, with the physics, I, <clears throat> I spoon feed it, dude. I spoon feed it. And people are like, I never thought I'd be doing physics. And like, <laughs> I told you it'd be okay. I've been doing this for a minute. All right. So that is acceleration. It is a pylon. And you have to understand that when we're dealing with the acceleration, that pylon, this is going to become a more... I guess the functional questions dealing with gravity. All right, when things fall, and since we're talking about gravity, gravitational pull has a rate of acceleration. In the metric system, it is nine point eight meters per second squared. In the U.S. customary system or British, it is thirty-two feet per second squared. So, when I hold this dry erase marker in the air and I let it go, the rate of acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared or 32 feet per second squared. Okay? Okay. All right. So you have to differentiate because sometimes they may come at you with a U.S. customary type situation. Acceleration is 32 feet per second. Sometimes they will come at you from a metric system perspective. So you have to be, you have to have your mind kind of, you know, <clears throat> going in, uh, or not, you know, you're just, you're adjusting is what you're doing. You're adjusting to the situation because the test is reactive. <clears throat> all right, did you get all that? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> so, You and I, we are on the tall building. Those are windows. Don't laugh at my artwork. <laughs> it's like a jail cell. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to drop water balloons. That's me. And that's you. All right. So we're going to drop water balloons. And we're going to think on my sign in terms of metric. And I'm just going to put U.S. C, U.S. customary system. <clears throat> now, we've established that gravity's going to 98 meters per second squared and 32 feet per second squared. Okay. So, one thing I want to make, you, I want you to be clear about. Let's say I drop something and it is 30 kilograms. And then you drop something and it is 15 kilograms. And we go one, two, three, and we let them go. Which object is going to hit the ground first? We'll hit the ground at the same time. I'm sorry? We'll hit the ground at the same time. You've been watching my videos. <laughs> that is correct. We'll both hit the ground at the same time. Because the uh, gravity is going to act proportional to the mass of the object. All right. So, we release these objects at the same time. I'm the metric side. You're the U.S. customary system side. How fast are the objects going to be falling after one second? So 
So it's second squared. It wouldn't be 32 feet, would it? 32 feet per second. Yeah. Okay, so 32. We just say 32 feet per second, now 32 feet per second squared. So it why is it second per second? 32 feet per second per second. Oh. Like second squared. Well, that's that's... That's the, because that is the acceleration rate. We say it like that because every second you're going to gain 32 feet per second. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got it. That's why yeah, we say it like that, man. All right. All right. So what about my side, my object? After one second, how fast is it going to be forward? 9.8 meters per second. All right. 9.8 meters per second. And it's very, very important that you do not use the per second square because we're just talking about the velocity. Right. All right. And if we want to have a formula for velocity, it would be A, which is the acceleration rate of gravity times time in second. So after one second, it's really 9.8 times 1 on this side, or 32 feet per second times 1, which is 32 feet per second. What about in 10 seconds? How fast are these objects going to be falling towards the Earth? How fast are they going to be falling towards the Earth? Mm -hmm. After 10 Set. seconds. We release 1,001, so, 1,002, 1,003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1,010. They'll be, they'll be falling at the same speed. You think? No. I think not. So this is why, this is why, this is why I went into... Getting you to understand about from pile on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every okay. second. You see per second squared. Per second yeah. squared. Every second we're going to build 9.8. 9 yeah. So here we're going to be at 19.6. And here after two seconds we're going to be at 64 feet per second. Again, velocity equals acceleration rate times time in seconds. So we just multiply it by two. For that yeah. particular case. But what about after 10 seconds of free fall? Uh, the right side will be at 320, and the left side, uh, sorry, meters per second, or feet per second. And then uh, the left side will be at. Uh, and when you multiply by 10, you. All right. All right. What about in 25 seconds? Both cases, you know I have to give you a hard one. You know I wasn't going to let you go without uh, rattling your cage a little bit. <laughs> that's, right, let's see. that's what I do. <clears throat> the right side, we got 8,000 feet per second. 8,000? 25 seconds, 32. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was like, that didn't yeah. feel right. I just, you know, that's what I was going to say. 800. 800. My bad. 800. 800? Okay. Yep. All right. 245. 245 meters per second. 800. So 800 feet per second. Here. And then 9.8 after 25. Yeah. Looks like I can still hear you, but oh, there it goes. Never mind. Everything okay, bud? Yeah. What was your uh, metric side? Uh, 245. 9.8 times 25. Very good. So 245 meters per second. After 25 seconds of free fall. Yep. Okay. So, it's really, really important. I cannot beat this into your head enough. Acceleration rates are about piling on after a second, after a second, another second, another second, it's another second, in order to find your velocity. Gotcha. You just multiply the acceleration rate times time. Now, a rapid math technique. 
Let's say the ASTB gave you these two questions. All right, 25 seconds. And let's take the, 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 the U.S. customer side. So we're multiplying 32 times 25. And my answer selections, A, B, C, I'll just say that, were, and I'm just saying hypothetically, you know what, and then let's change this up. I'm about to give you a math jewel, man. Right. Save you time. Let's say the acceleration rate was 45 feet per second. And we had whatever numbers here, but the last digit here was two. The last digit here was four. And the last digit here was zero. Which one would you pick? C. Charlie. Because the two times the five is going to dictate the last digit in your answer. Right. So a lot of times in testing, I'll be sitting there, I'll look at the two and the five, I'll look at this, bang, C. Boom, I'm done with that question. Yeah. Done. It's a little bit harder because the decimal has a slide on the metric side, but if you get the U.S. customary side, that is a very rapid way of uh, getting to your answer. But even on the metric side, you can probably guess where the decimal is going to be. You know based what? I got, a, I got a thing for that, too. Yeah. But now, in this case, I'm going to say 10 times 25, and I'll come up with 250. And, two, and if my answers are sp spread out far enough, I'm going to go with the 240 because it's close because the difference between 9.8 and oh, 10 yeah, is yeah. 0.2 it's small yeah, it's I got just you. small so you just round it yeah just round it to 10 and it's easy 25 times 10 250 done mm -hmm. you're going to be in, under enough stress oh man I'm trying to get this pilot slot and you know so that's a lot of what I teach, like a lot of time-saving math techniques, you know? For sure. Okay. Um, anything squared, you should be able to answer, and there's a five on the end, you should be able to answer these questions in like three seconds. Could you? Uh, I used to. <laughs> okay. All right. Whenever there's a five on the end of a number being squared, I guarantee you that the last two digits are going to be 25. Yeah. Yeah. Guarantee. 25. So if you had this and then you look at your answer selection, the one with the 25 is your answer. But let's say you have multiple answers and there's a 25, like in these in these particular situations. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look at the number preceding the five. And you're going to multiply by the next consecutive number. The next consecutive number after two is three. Two times three is six. Six twenty five. The next consecutive number after three is four. Three times four is twelve. Twelve twenty five. The next consecutive after four, twenty twenty five. And thirty twenty five. I did not know that. It's a cool trick. And that's one to grow on. And you could, t I could have one guy like, no, no, I don't believe that. You can't, you can't solve it that fast. I'm like, okay. Grab your calculator. I'll wait. That's <laughs> <laughs> a grab your calculator. I'll wait. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, um, it's nothing that I discover. It's just, you know, when you're in a particular yeah. job where you're, you're working with numbers a lot. Um, I've worked with numbers all my life. Uh, you know, in certain industries that I've been involved in, and so yeah, it's been you start a few to, years. You start to see, you start to see just a relationship with numbers. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Um, 